Uh, welcome to Pediatric Hypertension Management. This is a session you won't want to miss with Dr. Suzanne Berman. And Dr. Berman is kind enough to join us today and will speak for the next hour on this topic. And we're very much, I am very much looking forward to it personally. And without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Dr. Berman. Sure. Thanks for inviting me. It, it truly is a, a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here with you all. Um, so first of all, I'm a general pediatrician. I'm um, not a nephrologist or a cardiologist or really anybody who has specific, uh, a lot of specific training or, or expertise in this. But this is um, a clinical topic that has interested me because it started as a QI project. Um, uh, uh, several years ago in our practice, we were sort of, you know, patting ourselves on the trapezius saying, you know, what a great job we did with hypertension management and how many kids we had. Um, and then as we did a chart review and really dug into our data, we found we were missing a lot of kids um, who really needed more management than we were getting. Um, we were sort of um, screening only obvious give me patients. We weren't really following uh, the, the then guidelines. And then at about that same time, uh, the AAP led by uh, Joe Flynn, uh, who's a, an awesome nephrologist in Seattle, came out with the new 2017 guidelines. So um, sort of putting all that together, we uh, sort of reinvented how we did it. And I'm glad to say we I think we are missing a lot fewer kids now. Um, so just as a sort of overview of what we're going to talk about, um, first of all, uh, as, as we found out, sort of uh, as a, a, not quite a slap in the face, but still it was surprising. Um, Pediatric hypertension may be much more common than you think. Um, we're going to briefly review the new 2017 AAP guidelines for um, diagnosing uh, and uh, managing and treating hypertension. Um, I'm going to uh, show you a couple slides on how to take a good blood pressure. That That is a very sort of basic nursing topic. Um, but um, just like we do uh, BLS to remind ourselves how, how deep to compress every year uh, or every couple of years, I think it's a, a good sort of basic skill to, to revisit. Um, and finally, I want to give you some tips on doing ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Um, we have done a lot to um, uh, sort of buy equipment to manage other chronic diseases, but most general pediatricians that I've talked to don't have an ABPM machine. Uh, we got one a couple years ago and we love it. So hopefully I can, uh, and if I can figure it out, anybody can figure it out. Um, but so hopefully I can give you some tips on how to do that, how to demystify it. Um, and, and there's also a financial case for doing it, which I hope to touch on. Um, so moving ahead here, um, just to give you an idea of how common um, pediatric hypertension is, um, I, huh, I'm about to start my, my 20th year out of residency. Um, and when I trained, um, we got a lot of good training on asthma, asthma action plans, uh, really titrating um, uh, inhaled corticosteroids um, and long acting betas. Um, and also ADHD was a very much a, a bread and butter um, uh, thing that we learned to manage in our, in our clinics. Um, certainly, I can't manage all asthma and all ADHD. You know, kids with ADHD who also have autism and um, a mood disorder and anxiety, those kids are probably best best served by uh, child psychiatry. Ditto, you know, severe persistent asthmatics by pulmonology or allergy. But for most kids with asthma and ADHD, I feel like I came out of training really prepared to do that. Um, the next, uh, uh, the next sort of um, thing that we've sort of Come, it's sort of come into its own maybe since I've been out is pediatric mental health, um, primarily anxiety and depression. Um, those also are, are actually pretty common. Um, and now we're screening for uh, pediatric depression. Now there's, the Academy has done a lot of work around um, uh, recommending that all adolescents be screened for depression, substance abuse. Um, we also pick up a lot of anxiety. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, in the past three months now more than ever. Um, and um, actually the slide actually blanked it out, but in epilepsy and type one diabetes, we think about, although those sort of are, are still maybe in the realm of specialty care, but we still screen for them. But um, hypertension 
is actually as common as depression, um, uh, according to some of the, the literature that I read. It's about 3% of all kids in your pediatric practice. And then if you look at just the adolescent population, it's, it's as high as 10 to 12%. Um, in, in, some, in some areas, in some practices, it might even be more than that. Um, so my, my argument to you, if, if you feel um, strongly about screening for depression, if you have your asthma, ADHD, anxiety, sort of your ducks in a row and you're looking for what's the next most common thing I really could be doing more, I think um, pediatric hypertension could be that thing. So um, let's talk a little bit more about what the 2017 guidelines did as far as changing the definition of pediatric hypertension. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because y'all are very intelligent people. You can read, and, and many of you have probably uh, studied these very well, but uh, just as a, a very quick refresher, um, there are new tables, and you can actually get this. This is the red reference at the end of the slide deck um, that allows you to look up a child's age and sex. Um, so this is, a, 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 this is on the one-year-old male table. And then you look at the child's um, height, because that, that's basic physics, right? We know that uh, pressure equals rho GH, right? So um, a taller child can be expected to have a higher blood pressure to, to help push that column of blood up back to the um, right atrium. Um, and then let's say that our, we have a one-year-old child who's 80 centimeters. Um, so you basically read the table top to bottom, um, the 86th percentile. I'm sorry, 86 um, millimeters of mercury is 50th percentile for their uh, systolic blood pressure. And then there's also diastolic tables. Um, a couple of things about um, this particular um, set of norms that's different than the 2004 norms. Um, th there's lots of things I don't want to go into, but one of them is that, and I think this is pretty significant, is unlike the 2004 guidelines, the 2017 guidelines only include normal weight children, um, which is which is interesting because so many kids now are um, overweight or obese. Um, we were sort of gradually trending in uh, by using just every kid as part of the data set. We were gradually trending that um, elevated blood pressure became normal because we know that kids um, who are heavier weights have more hypertension and elevated blood pressure. Um, so just because it's normative doesn't necessarily mean it's normal or healthy. So by excluding um, uh, overweight kids in this data set, we have a much better uh, picture of um, uh, normal as defined as, as healthy uh, and not going to cause uh, cardiac risks downstream um, as opposed to just oh, a bunch of kids are you know, just like you might say, well, a bunch of 10-year-olds are 250 pounds. It's no big deal. You, you, we wanted to have um, good, and accurate, um, good and accurate data. So a few things on how to measure blood pressure properly. Um, like I said, this is sort of a, sort of a basic task um, that, that happens every day in our offices. Um, if um, you have medical assistants uh, or nurses obtaining your blood pressures, it's probably worth a once a year check-in just to, to watch their technique. Um, a lot of people do it wrong. And obviously if you have bad data in, you can't make good decisions going forward. Um, so um, I've listed some sort of, uh, all, all the things you can do wrong. Um, obviously um, if a patient is uh, cold in your office, it's going to uh, make their blood pressure go up. Obviously, nicotine or caffeine ingestion. So, if they've smoked or vaped or uh, had a huge, you know, latte uh, with with uh, lots of uh, caffeine in it, that's also going to make their blood pressure go up. Um, and also, um, a full bladder uh, can uh, make your blood pressure go up. We we know that um, you can have a um, an autonomic uh, dysreflexia sort of thing, like um, uh, kids who have. Uh, a neurogenic bladder, um, and they don't uh, catheterize themselves uh, uh, adequately, and so gradually over time um, they become hypertensive um, because of autonomic disref dis dysreflexia. But um, uh, just having a full bladder makes you tense. <laughs> I will attest to that, and um, you want to get people as relaxed as you can. Um, bad patient positioning. Um, Constrictive clothing, um, you got to 
unbear the arm. You can't really do it over a sleeve. Now you can argue, well, a very thin t-shirt sleeve probably isn't going to uh, affect your blood pressure as much as if the kid is still wearing their parka in the in the middle of the Vermontian winter. Um, but um, really to get a good accurate reading, they need to um, have their arm bared from the, the shoulder down. Um, moving and talking, kind of like you're at the dentist and the, you the, you you got your mouth open and full of uh, of 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 hands and gloves and and suction equipment and the the dentist or hygienist. So how's your summer going, Suzanne? And you say, oh, you know. So um, if your nurses are trying to make small talk while they're taking blood pressure, uh, tell them to not do that. Um, and then positioning. Um, I, I I included some pictures here of of all the wrong way to position patients. You know how like. You, you go to find pictures of free babies to put on your website and or uh, royalty free babies and all the babies are sleeping on their stomachs with a bunch of pillows uh you know they're not following the the ABCDs of safe sleep um most of the pictures of people having their blood pressure taken uh by medical professionals or actors or some of both um are uh are, are not really the right way to do it um so i i sort of um calling out these pictures um you need to have the arm supported on a table um holding the elbow in your wrist like you see in the top picture is um is not a good way to get a nice relaxed arm um and at best uh especially if you have these huge uh muscular teenage boys whose arms weigh as much as uh you know i don't know a, a a, a enormous watermelon um not just steadying it but it's going to be shaking in your hand as you as you try to support it um and and it gets really exhausting so um have them rest their elbow on a table or a flat surface um obviously um uh many of us uh including our practice before we sort of oh <laughs> we're doing this wrong um Kids are perched up on the exam table with their feet dangling and their back unsupported when we take their blood pressure, just like in these pictures. Um, that actually also raises their blood pressure um, because they're 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 stiffening their muscles um, uh, and they can't they can't truly relax. Um, crossing your legs, uh, as you see in in that uh, never do this picture, uh, also raises your blood pressure. Um, and then the arm, um, not at the level, like the cuff should be at the level of the, the right atrium where their heart is. Um, uh, again, because of uh, fluid dynamics, physics, um, and don't necessarily see their arm lower or higher in the seated position if a kid is reclining um, and uh, their arm's sort of hanging off the side of the bed or whatever, you need to, again, support it uh, with something firm and flat. Uh, to get a good to get a good reading so uh don't don't be like don't don't be like these um i i'm going to uh repeat the the pick the right size cuff mantra or meme uh i'm sure you heard that uh uh many many times from your cardiologist again this is the most common reason why blood pressure measurements are not accurate um in ambulatory uh pediatrics and uh in adult medicine as well um the cuff bladder width which is this width here um if you can see my mouse um needs to be 40% of the circumference of the middle of the upper arm um you don't want like a like a an armband for morning kind of uh, like a narrow sort of armband to to show your team colors um you want it to be um you want it to be adequately wide um and also the bladder length needs to be 80% or greater of the circumference of the middle of the upper arm. Um, now, this is sort of a, a, a basic question, but I did ask myself many times, what do you mean the cuff length should be greater than 80%? Because it has to be at least 100% or it won't wrap, right? Um, but a, the bladder doesn't take up the whole length. See all this um, velcro -y stuff? There's no cuff bladder there, so the bladder. And actually, if you get out a, um, uh, if you get out a, a blood pressure cuff, um, you can sort of see the bladder is sort of a rectangle that fills out this space. So this space 
needs to be greater than 80% of the circumference of the middle of the arm. Obviously, if you can't wrap the ends around each other, it's too small, duh. Um, but it's, it's, probably, it's probably way too small if you can just get them to connect, if that makes sense. Um, obviously, a cuff that's too big artificially lowers your blood pressure. Uh, a cuff that's too small artificially uh, raises the result. Um, and uh, here are some examples of cuff sizes. Every manufacturer seems to have slightly different uh, sizes uh, for their cuffs. This is uh, uh, one of the standard um, uh, manufacturers of blood pressure equipment. Um, but, they, but you might have slightly different cuff sizes. Um, again, the, the extra large adult um, is also called the thigh cuff. Um, that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean that you have to put that on the thigh. Um, that, um, because if a kid um, who is super large in their arms, you can't find a cuff big enough, chances are their thigh is even bigger. So don't use the biggest cuff and trying to make it fit. Uh, um, we, we call it thigh cuff um, because there are uh, situations in one in which you want to do um, a four extremity ambul uh, four extremity blood pressure, like to uh, look for uh, coarctation of the aorta, and uh, you um, even though the the small adult cuff may be uh, the right size to encircle uh, forty and eighty percent of the circumference of the middle of the upper arm, um, legs tend to be bigger than arms, and so you may have to go a couple sizes up to get a thigh measurement to um, uh, to do uh, ambulatory blood pressure measurement on, on all four extremities. Um, although generally, uh, and when we say thigh, we usually mean um, uh, uh, lower thigh and, and measuring it at the, the popliteal fossa. There's a, there's a great place to hear the cough sounds there. Um, but what else was I going to say about this slide? Um, Oh, um, if your biggest cuff isn't large enough because um, you have a, a, a very, very large child or young adult, um, you can use the largest size you have and actually do um, the forearm, um, which is, is giving us some perspective distortion here in the camera, but um, you can actually do the anterior forearm and, and listen there. Um, again, you need to elevate that to the level of the heart um, uh, and not let it sort of hang sort of floppy down uh, below the heart or it's going to alter your reading. Um, so again, measuring blood pressure properly, the final sort of thing that you need to check is make sure that your equipment is okay. Um, people ask what's better, um, a manual uh, uh, aneroid sphig manometer or um, uh, should you use an oscillometric machine, which is or we call the automatic machine? Um, I think there's pros and cons to both. Um, manual is more um, uh, is both better and worse. Um, you um, should always recheck a high um, automated blood pressure measurement manually, and it needs to be someone um, experienced in in measuring blood pressure. Um, there are lots of uh, problems you can get with manual measurements, um, like if you've ever had the uh, that nurse um, who puffs it up in three puffs. Okay, your you know blood pressure is 120 over 110. You know, impossibly low pulse pressure because they they pumped it up and then didn't let it out slowly. Um, I I'm only 47, but I am having a really hard time doing manual blood pressures now because of my hearing loss. Um, it's really hard to tell when that um, the fourth carot cuff sound disappears um, for the, the diastolic blood pressure. And so um, uh, making sure that they're wrapped and positioned appropriately and doing an oscillometric um, is probably better for me just in a pinch. But I do try to confirm high blood pressure manually, uh, although it's usually I'm asking one of my nurses to do it. Um, and then obviously, if you're um, if you have a manual uh, machine, uh, a, a manual sphygmo, sphygmo manometer, um, you want to make sure that it's it's calibrated from time to time. Um, so moving on, how do we diagnose hypertension? Obviously, we take blood pressures uh, in a good, uh, accurate way, but the, okay. So what do you do with that? Um, 
this is a very busy slide. Um, I want to just pull out a couple things. Um, if you check it at a well checkup or at a, uh, a random visit uh, for a child that you maybe don't have a recent one on, um, and it's above the 90th percentile for their age and height and gender, um, you want to recheck it two more times in that same visit. Um, you want to do them about 10 minutes apart. Um, and again, with the kid sitting quietly, uh, not talking, positioned properly. Um, and then you want to repeat, uh, and then you want to average the three measurements together. Um, if that average is not in the normal range, then this is the AAP guidance on what to do. And sort of, it sort of depends on how high it is, um, which is the, the three rows. Um, you see them back and recheck it either in six months if it's between the the 90th and 94th percentile, um, and then uh, in one to two weeks if it's above the 95th percentile, and obviously if it's um, uh, above the, the 95th plus 12 millimeters of mercury, which is actually very quite high, um, that's uh, uh, that involves pretty much immediate referral to a specialist. And obviously if they're having symptoms, um, it's extremely high or o over 180 over, if it's over 180 over 120, um, that's an ER referral to um, your children's hospital for management. Um, most kids that our practice sees are sort of hovering a little bit over the 90th. Um, when they come back in six months, um, if it's still high, um, then you want to um, do a four extremity blood pressure and then see back in six months. If at that third visit, um, they're still having elevated blood pressure, then you need to treat them as hypertensive until you prove it otherwise with a normal uh, ABPM, ambulatory blood pressure uh, set of measurements. Um, and obviously, if it's at not the 95th percentile, you accelerate because you, the second visit that you see back is uh, at, th at three months instead of six. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about ABPM before we dive into the practical applications of how you use it. Um, so blood pressure is not static, right? It, it goes up and down. Um, it tends to be lower when you sleep. It tends to be higher when you're up and active and talking and exercising. Um, and so trying to diagnose hypertension just based on one measurement in the office is uh, fraught with peril, obviously, um, because most high measurements will regress to the mean when you recheck them. And that's why um, the AAP recommends this sort of um, serial uh, checking and rechecking over time. Um, but at the end of the day, even if you do several measurements in the office, you're still doing uh, all your measurements basically in the daytime hours while the kid is awake. Um, and you're only capturing that very sort of narrow snippet of activity. You know, okay, it's, it's high here, it's not. Um, almost 50% of kids with an elevated blood pressure in some samples don't truly have hypertension. They have what we call white coat hypertension, which is basically it's only high when you're at the doctor's office, which seems really high. Um, but I will say um, earlier in my practice, I made the mistake of just sort of blowing it off. And especially if it was, now if it was super high, yeah, that's, it's probably a thing. Um, but I would see kids four and five and six and seven times who had blood pressures in the, the 90th percentile, and they weren't really um, going up dramatically between visits, but maybe they were slowly sliding up. And I would say, mm, it might be something, but it's probably just white coat hypertension. Um, we'll just check it back next time. Um, and I, I, I felt stupid about referring them to cardiology if it was nothing, um, but I, I didn't feel good about just ignoring it in the future, so I put a note on their chart. The great thing about um, ABPM is it lets you with pretty high level of con with a pretty high degree of confidence will let you rule out kids who have white coat hypertension which is 50% of kids so that means if you're getting elevated measurements on uh anywhere between uh you know 
four, five, six percent of kids in your practice, which is if you have a couple thousand kids in your practice, that's that's not as small of a number as 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 you might think otherwise. Um, you can, um, with pretty good de- uh, definity, say you don't have hypertension. We are we are going to leave this alone, and we'll recheck it at your next you know scheduled well visit. Um, or you can say definitively, no, this isn't white coat hypertension. We need to um, evaluate you and, and start treating you. Um, and so this tool has um, really kind of like spirometry for asthma has really um, added a huge um, weapon to my arsenal of treatment options. Um, and so it's just that alone. I think it's worth um, thinking about investing in, in one of these machines. Um, the other thing is um, doing um, uh, an ABPM um, to rule out some of these um, kids where your um, your measurement table is sensitive but not specific, i.e. it's picking up kids who have white coat hypertension but not um, ruling them out, um, which ABPM can do. It's extremely cost-saving. Um, when you think about the labs that you're supposed to order for kids who are hypertensive, um, we're going to get to that in a minute, that's some big bucks. Um, and if you send them to the children's hospital uh, to get an echo, that's going just that, it, which all, all you know, uh, all, all decent cardiologists are going to do an echo if you refer a kid for a rule out hypertension, right? Um, um, it's incredibly cost savings. Um, I've read a lot of articles that say uh, it's not worth buying a machine uh, in a, at a primary care office. Um, you should just send them to cardiology, um, except um, the cost of this test when done at the children's hospital, um, when you count in the facility fee and the um, extremely high rates that children's hospital get paid to do this procedure, it's $1,200 to do an ABPM reading through the children's hospital. Um, and that's, and that's payment, not just charges. Right. Um, so, um, and, and you could buy, if you do two of those at a children's hospital, you've bought the machine. Um, so I, I, I think it's definitely, um, cost savings if you can, um, sort of suss out the simple ones and then send the really complicated kids to, uh, the children's hospital, uh, to see the cardiologist or the nephrologist, whoever you have in your area. Um, obviously, um, ABPM is the only way you can identify masked hypertension. Masked hypertension is the flip of white coat hypertension, where they're normal in the office when they see you, but then they go home and they have much higher blood pressures, um, or they don't dip appropriately when they sleep. Um, There is not good guidance on which kids you should randomly send home with ABPM uh, if they have normals. Um, we, we, We do know um, from specialty studies that kids with obesity, which is like a lot of my practice because I practice in the biscuit belt, um, have uh, mast hypertension. Um, and kids who have had um, cardiac conditions like coarctation repair also have uh, mast hypertension. I, I don't feel so bad about um, uh, not screening those kids with ABPM because they're already seeing a cardiologist who has much more experience and ex- uh, than, than I do in this. But when I think about um, lots of um, uh, kids who are heavy in my practice, um, I, I want to think about, is there something I should be doing for them looking for that? Um, also, um, one of the, uh, the criteria um, to look at the severity of hypertension is to know um, the degree of dipping which is basically the difference between daytime and, and, and nighttime blood pressure. Um, obviously, when you're asleep, your blood pressure is supposed to go down. Um, the, the stress on your body is basically the total area under the curve. If you have some spikes during the day, but your nighttime blood pressure is nice and low, um, that is uh, much less concerning than um, someone whose blood pressure is running kind of high all day, and then when they go to sleep, for eight hours, it doesn't really drop like it should. That um, can also indicate certain underlying metabolic conditions. Um, Kids who have um, sleep apnea. um, Many kids, like my second son, um, 
snore and had, you know, uh, terrible morning breath and um, had apneustic pauses while they slept. Um, but then um, once they get their, their adenoids and or tonsils out, they're, they're like a whole new kid. Um, other kids um, who are heavy and tend to be older, um, teenagers, will um, uh, not reduce their um, sleep apnea after they have their adenoids and tonsils out if they do because it's it's either more central or it's farther down than their tonsils um and so um many of these kids also have elevated blood pressure and so when they sleep and so this is a way uh to find those kids um and then also when you're determining med changes um here's basically the screening tests that are recommended um we don't want to necessarily uh uh go through all of these. Um, I, I think these are pretty uh, normal. I think many of us do this already in, as part of a, a lipid screen. Um, uh, other studies for the most part are uh, not recommended um, as part of the initial workup. Um, the only exception is an echocardiogram because you do want to look for left ventricular hypertrophy um, uh, when you're starting medication. Um, so, um, uh, we know that EKGs are not really as useful in kids, um, and especially EKGs read by, um, adult cardiologists who are also always very concerned about the inverted T wave in kindergartners. Um, the, even expert pediatric cardiologists say that, um, EKGs are just not as useful, but, um, echoes can be. So your specialist wanting to do that is, is okay. Um, renal ultrasounds, um, and and other sort of uh the, the sexy tests uh the uh the uh, angiography tests um they do have roles i think those probably should be better ordered by a specialist um and um young kids skinny kids under age 6 who have um uh elevated blood pressure those are more likely to be um uh renal in nature renal artery stenosis congenital uh, kidney disease um, than older kids, teenagers, especially older kids who tend to be heavy. Um, those younger kids, I would probably refer sooner um, and have a lower threshold for, for calling in the specialist than some of these bread and butter uh, teenagers. All right, so let's talk about ABPM machine uh, in our last few minutes here. Um, so how do I pick one? Um, again, you know, you can just you know, call your friendly neighborhood McKesson or PSS person and say, what do you have in stock? Um, the AP guideline recommends um, this list, which um, has uh, a list of studies that have validated certain machine types in certain populations. Um, I will say that, um, and this is me talking, um, it hasn't been updated in a long time. And so machines that used to be called that that they used to be called the Excelsior and now it's called the the BP Wonder machine you may have the BP Wonder machine and the Excelsior is approved but you don't see the BP Wonder and you're like well is this approved or not um you can also ask um uh your 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 favorite specialist what they use if they do it um and you can also see what authors use in studies um i will tell you that um uh the one this is kind of funny um, one of the machines that is not uh, recommended based on where AAP says go here for a recommended device is actually what Joe Flynn and a lot of other American nephrologists who publish childhood blood pressure studies use. Um, so even though it's not officially recommended, a lot of the experts still um, use it, which I think is a, a, a little funny. Um, here's one big caveat. Um, be sure your choice has a way to interpret pediatric studies. And so um, if your salesman says, oh, yes, uh, we have the we, we can do pediatrics, too, that usually means they offer cuffs in smaller sizes, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that it will do all the interpretation for you, just like EKG machines are based on uh, adult normals, and they tend to give a lot of um, sort of nonsense in their interpretation uh, when you do um, EKGs on younger kids, the same holds true here. Um, we happen to buy a machine that doesn't have a pediatric interpreter, and we did a workaround. I'll get to that in a minute. Here's just some basic pictures of what it looks like, how it works. Um, uh, it's a little box. 
Um, again, there's a cuff choice that you do. Um, this is my teenager wearing it. Uh, you can see he's got the cuff on his arm and this fits into a little bag. Um, the bag is washable. This can be wiped down. So in here in the COVID era, um, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, too scary to um, reuse between um, to reuse between patients. Um, we get we have our patients come in um, and we we put it on and we do some tests while they have it on their arm um, and we give them a little uh, brochure and feel free to copy this or whatever. This is not um, anything very special um, on how to use it. Um, the main things that we tell them is um, we need daytime readings and nighttime readings. So when you lie down, go to bed. Um, uh, please click the little button that says, okay, I'm converting to night readings. Um, and then um, when you wake up again, click it back and you're going to go back to day readings. So we, we can definitely tell which ones are the, the nighttime slash sleep readings and which ones are the daytime readings. Um, and the other thing uh, we say is um, uh, do, do not immerse, do not shower, do not bathe, do not swim with it on. Um, uh, because obviously that will uh, zap the machine and, and possibly give you a shock. Um, so we tell people, you know, take a shower in the morning, come in in the morning, wear it all night, come back in the, the next day after it's been 24 hours, drop it off and then go home and take a second shower. I mean, obviously you can take it off and put it back on, but a lot of folks have trouble rewrapping the cuff after they put it on. Um, so this is, act, this is an action, and this is my son, so I'm, I'm not violating HIPAA here. Um, so, um. This is, an, um, this is what the result of the machine we, we use looks like. Um, this comes out um, in a PDF or text file format. Um, and it tells you basically um, what their systolic, diastolic uh, pressures were for, for various dates and times. Um, so um, when you're interpreting these, and again, the, um, the hypertension guidelines go through the exact metric of how you're supposed to do this. You discard outliers. Um, that are too low or too high, basically the impossible results. Make sure that you have um, 40 or more good measurements. And if you've set your ABPM machine to do every 20 minutes during the day and every 30 minutes uh, while asleep, which are the standard sort of settings, you're gonna easily get that. Um, and then basically you do some computations. Now, if your machine doesn't do this automatically, um, you can do this in Excel. This is basically numbers. This is spreadsheets, which of course is my love language. Um, but computing the mean of these is something you can do pretty simply by dumping this to Excel um, if you don't have an automatic pediatric interpreter. Um, so you get daytime and nighttime uh, averages for systolic and diastolic. Um, the load, which is um, the percentage of readings that are above the 95th percentile, um, and then dipping, obviously, as we talked about earlier, is the day or night difference. And you can tell which ones are nighttime because they have a little moon icon right there. Um, so after you've computed these numbers, um, here's the results for my kid. You basically compare them to a table of normals, which unfortunately is a different table of normals for ABPM measurements than for general or what they call casual blood pressure measurements that are outlined in the 2017 guidelines. Um, so it's a second table. Um, and then once you have, okay, um, here's the night percentile. Uh, the dipping is uh, 17%. Um, these are, again, these are computed off uh, the tables uh, um, that are provided in um, the ABPM normals, which you can, I also have in the references. Um, you can interpret that this is again just um, spreadsheets and running uh, running the numbers down an algorithm. Um, they're they have white coat hypertension if they're high uh, in your office but low at home. Mass hypertension is the flip. What's pre hypertension? Uh, what's severe hypertension um, if their load is is excessively high along with elevated readings uh, in your office and at home. Um, couple stages on treatment. Um, I am much less scared about prescribing um, antihypertensives than I used to be. Um, I, I've, I've given you sort of Suzanne Berman's three favorite choices, primarily because um, they're effective down to uh, uh, age six, or in some cases younger. Um, again, very young kids under age six, you probably don't want to treat by yourself. You want to send to a specialist. Um, they're also pretty cheap. 
Um, and they all come in, uh, actually, uh, HTTZ doesn't come in a liquid. Um, they come in, that comes in tabs. Um, but these are all pretty cheap, especially for people with high deductibles or self-pay. Um, uh, I think uh, the other thing that you can do is, hmm, which one do I do, is just like maybe with antidepressants where you say, Mama, I understand there's a family hist history of depression and you're taking something. What do you take? What works for you? Or what doesn't work for you? I think you can sort of use that same uh, strategy in uh, picking a class of drugs or a, partic or a particular drug uh, for um, a patient. Um, and then finally, um, actually, let me skip forward one. So here's my SOPUM slide. What is the return on investment for doing ABPM? Again, this is my office's experience. Um, so um, when they come in to have their, you know, we're seeing them and we've, 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 we've determined that they need ABPM. They've had three elevateds uh, despite, um, you know, some, some nutrition lifestyle counseling over a period of four months, six months, 12 months, whatever. Um, so um, they've come in. Um, and our nurse shows them how to wear it, the instructions and so on, gives them the little brochure, makes sure, you know, do you have any questions? Um, and we charge a 99211 nurse visit for that. Obviously, if a clinician does it and you're answering a lot more specialty questions, then you can build um, the regular uh, E&M code. Um, and um, then for the um, ABPM 24 hours of monitoring, we use 93784. And this includes both use of the machine as well as interpreting the results. Um, these, the studies I've read all have some caveat about, oh, insurance doesn't want to pay for this. Um, in two and a half years of doing this, I have never had a payer deny it. I don't get pre-authorizations. I don't have to uh, argue with insurance. And I do love to argue with insurance companies, but I've never argued about this. Um, the Medicare fee is about $47. Um, uh, our best payer, which is actually one of our Medicaid plans, pays a little bit over $100. Um, so again, that's something that you want to check your fee schedules if you're considering doing this, which I encourage you to do. Um, the machine is not cheap, um, but I would consider if you're a small practice and there's other small practices in your community that maybe you want to tag team with, you can collectively um, shell in for a machine and then share it amongst practices like the first week of the month Practice A gets it in the second week of the month. There's ways around this. Um, your staff has to teach patients. Um, the cost of physician interpretation, again, if it's automated it's and you just sort of review it and do a reality check, that's easy. If you're hand inputting numbers into Excel, um, I think it's still a cash win, although it's going to be lessened if you're spending a lot of time manipulating numbers. Um, there are ways to automate it. Um, but when you consider... Um, the cost of tracking a referral that you might not even need to do, plus all of the societal cost um, and direct medical costs of sending kids to a specialist, um, where it's going to be done much more expensively, especially now in the new world of P4P. Um, depending on, and you can make a little spreadsheet and, and plug in your numbers, um, the machine pays for itself between 33 and 85 uses, depending on some of these variables. Um, but um, this, is, this has been a big win for us. Um, and then finally, um, you, uh, getting back to what I said initially, you may feel like, mm, I don't know that I would make this work. I might do it five times and then I'm done. And what do I do with the machine? Um, when you find how many kids that you're not even checking blood pressures on at well visits, and, and I, I think most of the people who are on this call are, are pretty good. Um, nationally, it's about one-third of kids at checkups above age three don't get their blood pressures taken let alone was it taken accurately, was it high, did they come in for rechecks, um, did you do an ABPM? So um, I think if you um, are already doing a good job, on the other hand, of um, checking blood pressures and making sure that um, uh, your, your numbers are okay, um, but then tracking them over time and not doing this, the Berman blow off, like I said, oh, I'm sure it's white coat hypertension. I'm sure it's okay. But actually definitively, um, you know, facing up and saying, I'm going to determine whether you need a workup or you don't. And then you can, um, I think it improves your sort of satisfaction that you're not sort of overreacting or, or underreacting. Um, be sure that you're checking all obese kids at every visit. That's actually one of the recommendations. 
Um, obese kids, even like four and five year olds, need to have their blood pressure checked at every visit, um, not just well visits. Um, and I again, that was not something we were doing, but when we started doing it, we started picking up more kids. It's like, ooh, um, we need to we need to stay on top of this and 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 really figure this out. Um, I think that's all I have. I've got some references. This red one is the the guidelines. These others are sort of how to do ABPM. Um, that's where I got my chronic disease numbers. And then here's some of the the sources for um, how we're as pediatricians not doing a good a job as we could be, and some specific recommendations for improvement. Um, I think that's all I have. That's all. That was 45 minutes <laughs> of awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, my gosh. Um, we don't have, well, let me double check. We, Of course, as I'm saying that there aren't uh, any questions, one came through. So if you don't mind uh, uh, spending a couple more minutes with us. Um, there's a question that came through. I think if you include the one to two follow-up visits for managing increased blood pressure in the office, the return on investment would probably be even better just by consciously deciding to evaluate and not so quick to refer. So that was much more support than a question. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, we've totally found that out. Um, and as you bring them back for other things, you can also, it's a lot easier to do the counseling when you're bringing them back. Mm. Um, because if, if you're, if you're going to say, well, we're going to recheck it in three months, it's actually not just a quick nurse in and out. Okay. It's still high. We need to sit down and talk about diet and nutrition and fitness and exercise and, and all those things that I should be doing too. And I've kind of been skipping during COVID. <laughs> um, and in terms of getting people back into your office, and thinking, you know, how can I recall kids to not just generate revenue because we're not really in this for the money. If we were, we would be investment bankers or orthopedic surgeons. Um, but um, how we can do well by our patients um, and, and missing blood pressure, which has long-term, lifelong consequences for missing it. Um, I, I really think I, I totally agree with um, the, the person who wrote that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's making opportunities to check in and to make contact with patients. There's never too many of those, like you say, especially now. Um, right. Something that I wanted to, uh, other than insisting that you and I go into business and create something for Hasbro called Royalty Free Babies. Um, right. Uh, the idea that all obese kids, you know, just there's so much common sense in this. I'm not a clinician. I am not trained at all in this stuff. And it makes so much sense to just step back and think about it. The, the populations that you're, you're recommending this for, or that it, that it's recommended for. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that caught my ear was the idea of device sharing. I love that for yeah. cutting costs, you know, that, that price yeah. tag, especially now, you know, a $3,000 price tag, if you've got somebody in your, your area and that raises awareness about the condition as well, there was just so much to this. I, I have a curiosity of my own, if you don't mind. Um, is there anything to the, um, the idea that if you do send them to, if that white coat syndrome is, or the white coat effect is a factor here, is that not exacerbated by sending them to a specialist, but maybe that they're less familiar with? Yeah, so, so the idea of sending them to a specialist is that the specialist is going to do ABPM. Um, uh, and they have access to a machine that you don't have. Um, and, and for that reason, um, that's a good reason to send them. Um, I will say that a lot of my specialists actually don't do it. Um, they go straight to echoes, hmm. um, which, again, I, I, you know, I can't say that's wrong. And that, that is a good way to say, as of now, um, do you have left ventricular hypertrophy? Do, do we see signs of, of damage going on? Um, they can much, def much more definitively than I can, because I, I don't really read ultrasounds, um, say no. But again, we're pediatricians, right? We prevent. And so um, just because you don't have damage yet that's visible on your echo doesn't mean that you're not running higher than you should be. Um, and so I, I do think, uh, and again, I'm a data geek, right? Um, and I, you know, I want to see, you know, lots of repeat numbers and, and evaluate trends and so on. And so this really does let you get um, a, a good sense of what numbers over time are. Um, some people say, well, I can do the same thing without, um, without an ABPM machine. I can just tell families to get a machine and log it at home. Um, and uh, they can bring their numbers in, and uh, we can sort of do it that way. Um, there, and that's actually a great thought. Um, the problem is, is that um, many families can't afford um, a home machine. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And finding one is really hard. I have had more trouble getting insurance to cover a home machine for a kid than I have doing a one-time ABPM for them. Um, And also, it's not just the machine. It's the right size cuff. Um, But the thing is, it is hard to remember to check. Now, when it's it's hung on your arm and it's walking around with you, it's checking all the time. I had um, uh, gestational hypertension with my my last baby. I was 43, old and fat, having a baby. Um, And I'm a doctor, right? And I understand the consequences (laughs) of not doing it. But checking my blood pressure, taking the medicine, counting my carbs, because I also had gestational diabetes, counting carbs, uh, taking my medicine for diabetes, uh, dipping my urine for ketones. I was getting freaking tired of it, and I was – I just didn't – do a good job um, measuring. And the other thing is that um, home-based measurements, a lot of times those are, don't give you any sleep measurements unless mom comes in and hooks it up to the kid while he's asleep, which, again, is within the realm of possible. Um, but getting um, a good data set um, mm. uh, from home actually practically is a lot easier with an ABPM machine, I think. Yeah. So. Well, Awesome. Thank you so much for this. This I, I find this stuff fascinating. And I, I also am a data geek. You'll have to thank Simon for me. When I saw those numbers show up on that slide, I got all kinds of excited. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just makes sense. And thank you again, Dr. Berman. I really appreciate this. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. My pleasure. Take Bye-bye. care.